What's going on? Welcome into the Monday edition of the Pelicans podcast presented by Seeky. I'm Daniel Salerson. Hope everyone had a great weekend. It's the last weekend without any Pelicans games, basically, as the Pelicans will tip off in just two days. They'll welcome in the Philadelphia 76ers. Glad to have you with us here on this Monday. Joining me today, Jim Eichenhofer of Pelicans.com, Aaron Summers, Pelicans sideline reporter and studio host. We all teamed up and wore our red this morning. I'm glad we're on the same page as we're just two days away. Uh, good morning, everyone. How was the weekend? I'll start with Aaron, and then we'll go to Jim. Good morning. It was a great weekend, a lot of fun. We obviously all went to the Pelicans open practice and had some other practices earlier in the week, so it's been a good stretch here getting ready for the home opener. Yeah, it was a great experience. I mean, I've been gone for a couple of weeks. Obviously, my dad passed away, so it's been a rough time for me, but it was great this weekend to be back around everybody and get to see people. I mean, as crazy as it sounds, I mean, there were some people that I have not really seen or had a conversation with since March 2020 because of the circumstances of the last year and a half. So it was it, it was it was a fun weekend and it was a it was a great event. Um, I think getting to see kind of another part of Louisiana that a lot of the players haven't seen was good experience as well. And uh, now we're looking forward to the regular season, and I'm excited to to get started. Yeah, glad to have you back, Jim. Of course, we're thinking of your family right now, but um, definitely Jim joining us here as he will for most of these podcasts throughout this season. I'm glad we uh, started with open practice because it was really eye-opening on our bus ride down there the other day just to see the destruction and still uh, people trying to rebuild even a couple months later or a month later after what happened here with Hurricane Ida. But you know, walking into that gym and seeing a, a pretty filled uh, gymnasium there at Nichols State, it was just good to see um, at least them give a little bit of a, a break from everything going on and, and to be able to watch a, a, an hour and a half practice. Aaron, what did you take away from the open practice? And I'll go to Jim. Yeah, starting with the trip down there, it was it, it was interesting to me just to see um, how the areas around here are still recovering from Hurricane Ida. You know, you're here in the city and things here have been pretty good. And then you kind of step outside and not very far outside of the city and see that people are still dealing with a lot of, of, you know, stuff still from the storm. So I think that hit home for a lot of people, you know, the players talked about it after the event that it was, you know, kind of crazy to still see all that. And it really was a good opportunity for the team to come in there. Coach Green talked about it at the beginning of practice, how he just wanted to give a little bit of joy to the people from that area for you know an hour, hour and a half of their time. And I think that they were able to do that. It was fun. There was a lot of fans there, as you mentioned, um, a lot of kids jumping around and screaming and excited anytime the basketball went through the hoop. Um, I don't think they really cared who was scoring, but <laughs> it's always fun to see them get excited and the, the, the players interacting with them after practice as well even though everything was a little bit distanced you know there's still a little bit of interaction from everybody and, and so that was cool just to kind of you know see them in a different element um kind of around the fans as they are again looking forward to being home on Wednesday yeah I I got a kick out of watching the a lot of the younger kids there were a lot of kids that were probably under say seven or eight eight years old who were jumping up and down in the stands when they were watching the scrimmage but also when the rookies were doing their dance competition, I saw so many kids up in the stands, you know, jumping around and going crazy. And they, they got, they had so much fun, I guess almost as much fun as I had watching mm -hmm. them dance around and just have a good time. So it was a, it was a really fun experience to be there and, and to have, you know, that part of Louisiana, get to see Pelicans practice up close and get to maybe get to know people a little bit better. Did, did Trey Murphy win best costume and best dance moves? I know the fans say he won the dance competition, but he might, he might've won both with his Scooby-Doo outfit. Mm -hmm. I've never had to do a post-practice media availability with a guy in a dog costume, but here we were on Saturday. It was just kind of odd to see. <laughs> yeah. I, I thought it was interesting that Garrett Temple said that uh, each of the rookies that they at least got to pick their own costume. So at least it wasn't like they were just, you know, given something that they didn't want apparently but he said that uh, he thought that Jose Alvarado lost a bet because he had to dress up in a hot dog costume. So <laughs> I don't, I don't know exactly. I, I, maybe I'll have to get to the, do some deep digging and, and intense research to get to the bottom of how that all came about. But, uh, but it, it was, it was hilarious to see Trey Murphy do a serious, semi-serious interview in a, uh, in, in a Scooby-Doo costume for sure. 
again, Jose did not look happy in that hot dog costume <laughs> at all. I don't think there's a single picture of him smiling <laughs> in that costume. <laughs> he's, that he's, surprised pretty, me. He, he's pretty intense. I remember speaking to him on media day before I took off that he, uh, he's, he's a pretty intense guy. So I don't know, I, I guess maybe even when he's in a hot dog costume and he's in a dance contest, he still has that game face on. That's, I guess yeah. that's my only theory. That Georgia Tech mentality in him, that's for sure. I, I was pretty impressed with Dalton Thomas in, in his dancing abilities, number one. His costume maybe looked like he was wearing a schmedium when he needed an extra large. It looked a little tight, but uh, I thought he pulled off Mario really well. So it was nice to see all the rookies dress up and, and kind of have some fun at the end of the practice. But now the fun begins for the Pelicans and for the rest of the NBA. Tomorrow is when the NBA tips off with a, a double header on team. T as usually does, but... The Pelicans uh, will have a, a nice game against the Philadelphia 76ers. Hopefully it's nice. But, of course, uh, we have to start with uh, the Pelicans will be without their main guy in Zion Williamson on Wednesday night. Uh, but we'll start with Aaron and then go with Jim. It just seems like, though, you know, from us watching practice these last couple of weeks and, you know, even the preseason, I know it was tough to watch at, at times, but there was no Zion Williamson, no Brandon Ingram, and no Jackson Hayes. Besides Williams, you're going to be pretty healthy heading into to Wednesday's game, Aaron. I feel like these practices have showed us that this team is deeper than we might've thought early on. It's pretty incredible to watch so many different players in so many different positions have so much success from the floor because these guys can shoot and you're seeing it from people like Jonas Valanciunas from outside, which is something they didn't have last year with a big guy that could come out and, and pop a three. Um, and then obviously with Devonte Graham, you know, as the ball handler, being able to add that outside threat as well. And then we've seen Trey Murphy come in and shoot lights out, which everybody thought he was going to be really good, but I don't think they expected him to be such an impact player so soon. We're seeing it in practice. We saw him elevate his game in the preseason play. So that's kind of, you know, what do you do with him? Do you start him because he's doing that? Or do you have him come in off the bench? Because right now, as you mentioned, there have been a few injuries throughout the preseason, which has changed up the lineup quite a bit. So again, you're not, seeing people in their natural roles, I don't think in the preseason games, which might have had an effect on the overall outcome. And it's still a young team. So they're still really getting to know each other and the chemistry is still developing. Uh, you know, Coach Green has continued to say he's very happy with what he's seen, the progress that they've made. He said all of the preseason games were a step in the right direction for this team. And he thinks that as long as they can continue to bring the effort that they have in practice and play with that force, the purpose that he wants to see them play with on the court, that, you know, he's really optimistic about what this team can do. Yeah. You know, I think I'm sure we're going to get into discussing him a lot more either later today or as the season progresses, but I'm not sure if, if I could be more impressed with a rookie in terms of the lead up to the start of his first regular season than I am with Trey Murphy both on and off the court. I mean, he was, he was outstanding again during the open practice on Saturday, one of the best players on the floor. So, I mean, that bodes really well as far as the impact that he can make. And as Aaron said, we don't know exactly what role he's going to be in, but I, I think he's going to do well, no matter how the team uses him. Um, as far as the depth goes, I, I, the one preseason game I did get to see a, all of was the last one against Utah obviously didn't go well, but one of the things I noted uh, Willie Green played 12 or 13 guys a decent amount of minutes and that was without Zion or Brandon Ingram available to that game so you add those two guys and of the 12 or 13 guys that played that night I was thinking okay this guy's going to play during the regular season I'm sure in some role but then you think about it and you're like there's no way to play 14 guys put 14 guys in a rotation I mean you can only have 13 active I think it is if the rules are still the same of what they have been under normal conditions so I'm really curious to see how the coaching staff decides who's not going to be in the rotation. It's going to be very tough because there's going to be guys that you say, based on our confidence in this player, what they've done so far in practices and games, they deserve to be and need to be on the court, but you're not going to be able to do that with everybody. They're going to be some tough decisions. I'm curious based on Willie Green's experience in the NBA extensively as a player and a coach, if he's ever seen a situation like this, where there's this many guys where the, dis the determination of playing time and roles is going to be so difficult to make. But obviously that's something that if they haven't already done, they're doing in the next day or two to go into Wednesday. But I think this team is really deep. Um, we, we talked about, you know, Zion not being available for the beginning of the season. 
one of the stats I saw recently that I thought was really interesting was the Pelicans were both two and nine last season without Zion and two and nine when Brandon Ingram didn't play. Um, that's discouraging, but I also think that this roster is more equipped to be competitive when one of those guys are out. Obviously Zion's going to be out at the beginning part of the season and hopefully they'll be able to put some wins together and still have a, a, a decent start to the season. Um, the two, two of the veteran additions between Devontae Graham and Jonas Valanciunas, both of those guys, I, I'm not sure if people realize that are maybe casual fans of the NBA, how much of impact those two had on their teams the last couple of years. And um, obviously I just talked about Trey Murphy as well. So I just think this team has a better chance to be able to withstand when some of the main guys are out. Hopefully Zion's not out that long, but for whatever stretch that is, um, I think this team can be more competitive than they were last year where, you know, they obviously really struggled based on the stats when they didn't have their two best players and biggest scorers. Well, Jim, you talked about wanting to talk about Trey Murphy later on in the show. So let's just bring it up now while we have the chance, you're going to drive the car here, I guess. Um, so <laughs> what about Trey Murphy? Uh, you know, we talked about on Saturday, the quick release from him on catch and shoot threes, just how quickly he's able to get the ball out of his hands. And most of the time going through the net, um, one, we all scratch our heads to figure out how he landed at number 17. He seems like a top 10 player the way he's playing now. And we know there'll be some up and downs throughout his rookie year. But, but what is sticking out to you, Jim, that is impressing you so much about the rook? I think having watched Summer League on TV and then parts of preseason on TV, um, one of the first things I noticed about him, especially when you have already seen how skilled he is, the kind of ball handling he is in his shot, obviously – is how big he is. And when you see him in person, you're like, man, he's bigger than I thought he was in terms of uh, he's like six, eight, six, nine. He's putting on more muscle, I think, as the summer of the offseason progressed. But just his skill level is incredible. His confidence is so high, too. You don't see that many rookies who come in immediately and they just look like they belong. He doesn't look like he's kind of, you know, tiptoeing around and being like, OK, am I good enough to do this? He's like I said, Saturday, he looked like one of the best players on the court the whole day. So um, he's just impressed me in some And off the court, I mean, people have seen his interviews. The guy is just really mature. You can tell he spent several years in college. Um, just a smart guy. And I think all of the coaches, you talked to his coach from Rice in a recent podcast. I think everyone that's coached him has mentioned that this guy is really intelligent. He's got high basketball IQ, and he has a lot of the intangibles that lead to a player having a successful career. So I'm excited to see, you know, Wednesday night, the regular season for him get started and his pro career officially begin. I think it was Devontae Graham who was joking around about the fact that like Devontae went to college for four years and Trey went for four years. And there's just something like smarter about guys like that. Yeah. that will stick around and and it is a maturity level. It is, you know, they continue to work hard on their craft and they come in ready and Trey's continued to work. You, you see it every day. And I think what's funny to me is the fact that he's kind of quipping at people in practice. Like he's not afraid of these veterans or these other guys around him. You know, he's challenging them in practice as well. And he really is trying to learn more too because he's mentioned it so many occasions how he is around all of these players, even coaches that have been in the league for so long and he wants to be somebody that plays 15 years in the NBA. So he's going to try to learn what it takes to do that um, every day. So yeah, he's somebody that wants to come in and play and have an impact. I think too, that, you know, the scouts, NBA scouts have the reasons of why a lot of times maybe a player who's been in college for three or four years, they kind of downgrade them because People say like, okay, well, if he wasn't good enough to get drafted after his freshman year, do we want him, you know, in comparison to somebody else? But not only I think the, the experience of being in college for multiple years helps, but just, I mean, it sounds really simple, but the difference between any, any person between when they're 19 years old and when they're 21, 22, a lot of times that makes a huge difference as well, mm -hmm. not just physically, but mentally as well. I, I mean, I'm sure all of us, if we look back at the way we were when we first started college and where the way we ended college, hopefully by the time <laughs> we were done with those four years, we were more mature and more ready to be a responsible member of society. So um, I do think that that helps. And, and sometimes you can see a difference with guys, just that the fact that when you're talking to them, you realize this is a guy who's 22, 23 and not somebody who 
just spent one year out of college and now he's 19 and he has to have all of this, this lifestyle and everything thrust upon him of being an NBA player. Speak for yourself, Jim. I'm not sure if I'm still contributing to society and I've been out of college for 10 plus years, but I appreciate you thinking that maybe that was the case. So um, another thing that I think a lot of people have questions about it and Willie Green is keeping it close to the vest, which is perfectly fine, is what the starting lineup might look like, especially without Zion Williams. And you're going to assume that maybe Brandon Ingram slides to the four, Jonas Valanciunas at the five. Uh, but one, two, three could be pretty interesting as far as what the Pelicans might do, especially in the backcourt. We have guys like Devontae Graham and the Key Alexander Walker. Do you stagger them where one starts, one comes off the bench? Or do you have that firepower out there right away and have them both start? But then you go into the, the second unit and figure out who is that backup point guard. Jim, uh, I feel like there's a lot more questions and answers right now. And again, if we have we talk about the depth of this team, these are good problems to have. But how do you see this backcourt rotation working out right now, um, especially in this week, first week or so? Well, I talked to some sources on Saturday, and by sources I mean the Pelicans beat writer contingent of <laughs> newspaper and website writers that were at the open practice. And I, I think they believe that the starting lineup initially is going to be um, Nikhil Alexander-Walker, Devontae Graham, Trey Murphy at the three, and then Ingram and Valanciunas that you mentioned as the four and the five. But I, I don't know. I mean, I don't think any of us know for sure whether that's going to be the case or not, whether this, the, the wiser move or the, the, the decision that they end up upon is having Trey come off the bench and have someone else start. But I feel like there's a lot of different options. Um, they have options in, in terms of backup point guard with Sadoransky, who I think is a really solid, steady, reliable guy that doesn't make mistakes, has a really good assist to turnover ratio, just like Devontae Graham does. Um, I don't know if you want me to go through the whole rotation right now, but um, you don't have to. <laughs> there's, there's, there's so many um, directions that they can go. So I think that's one of the biggest questions for Wednesday that people are curious about is what, what who is that? How do they determine the starting lineup? And are Graham and Nikhil going to be the the starting guards? It seems like if I had to, to uh, place a bet, which I can't because it's, that's illegal as an NBA employee, that might be the way I would go, but I'm curious to see what happens. And Aaron, uh, we talk about another guy in Kyra Lewis Jr. who I think there's a lot of not questions about him as a, as a player, but kind of where his role progresses here from year one into year two. Obviously, his rookie year was not a normal rookie year without training camp, without summer league for the most part. Um, and now you have a new head coach. But it seems like from us watching him at practice and him in the games, I mean, there could be some minutes for him, too, in that backcourt rotation. He's really good at creating a shot for himself. I mean, there's been a lot of opportunities for him to drive and he just kind of puts up an amazing, like huge arcing shot that just drops in and you're like, he's tiny, but he got that ball over everybody inside. So he's fun to watch. And you mentioned just his ability to kind of progress here with summer league and you know preseason play and having a lot of time in camp. Last year, I don't think they had more than like five practices as a team because of all the COVID restrictions. So as somebody who didn't play a lot of minutes, he didn't have a lot of opportunities on the court to get better, to actually go through the motions. Um, so his growth is going to be really interesting to see this season with the time he's actually gotten leading up to this year, kind of, you know, last year, I think wasn't a, a good year for a lot of rookies or a lot of younger players because of that. So it, it's something that, is going to be fun to watch across the league too um, with a lot of the younger guys to see how much they grow in this year. You know, that reminds me of just one of the points that I thought about throughout the off season, especially the latter part of the off season, when, when national media, TV analysts, whoever it is, make their predictions and they talk about what kind of record each team is going to have and how much progress and improvement a team is going to make. It seems like, and there's good reasons for this, but, it seems like a lot of the focus is on off season additions. And I think one of the things that's unique about the Pelicans is they have so many guys that are in year three or year two. And then, you know, the couple of rookies that were, that were brought in during the draft. So I'm really interested to see what kind of leaps players like Kyra can make and Nikhil and obviously Jackson Hayes and Zion are both in their third year as well. So. Yeah. And Najee Marshall, we haven't even yeah. brought him up too. Yeah. It, I, there's, that's the part I think that is so one of the reasons why I, th I don't think people talk about in their predictions is because it's so hard to, 
to figure that out. It's kind of one of those things where you have to be almost there every day to see the work that the player is putting in. And no one's, and it won't, no one in the media is able to do that because we're, we're talking about private workouts in the summer when guys are by themselves working out. Um, but I do think that that's going to be a huge factor in terms of how much the Pelicans improve this year. Um, there are other teams in the NBA that are as young as the Pelicans or, or younger, but I'm not sure if there are many teams that have as many players as the Pelicans do who they're counting on that were drafted in maybe the top half of the first round over the last three years that, that, you know, this is the part of the, of everyone's career where they make a huge jump. So if the Pelicans have a bunch of guys that are able to do that, I think we'll see that they can, you know, maybe exceed expectations from an outside standpoint. All right. So before I let you two go here on this Monday, let's talk about Wednesday since you both uh, might not be on the podcast on Wednesday, Jim, I'm assuming you will, but let's talk about the 76ers squad who is, I would say coming off a disappointing season, the way things ended for them against the Atlanta Hawks. Um, but at the same time, of course, they're going through some drama as well with the Ben Simmons situation as he's back with the team, but not sure if he'll be available on Wednesday night against the Pelicans. So there could be one man down for each side, but I'm not sure chemistry wise, what the 76ers are up to, you know, Tyrone Maxey, um, as far as what he's, you know, capable of doing, if he's going to be that starting point guard for the Sixers, I guess with all my rambling, I'll start with Jim and him with Aaron is what's sticking out with you about this matchup with Philadelphia on Wednesday, a team that could be pretty vulnerable on Wednesday, but also, um, could be, you know, ready to go based on how things went. Yes. Last season. Yeah, there's a couple things when I think about the Sixers as far as what they've gone through recently. I mean, I would think if you're around the team, in some ways, it's almost like, wait, hey, guys, media, you know we have a game Wednesday, right? Like, you know that we're actually about to start the regular season because there's been so much talk about Ben Simmons and focus on that that I feel like um, the fact that they actually are starting a season, I mean, I guess from a Pelican standpoint, you hope that they're distracted and you hope that they've had to expend so much energy on that, that they're not totally locked in Wednesday um, and ready to ready to start the season and ready to play that game. Um, On the other hand, though, I do think that um, sometimes we need to take a step back and remember that this was a one seed in the Eastern conference. And despite the controversy and issues that they have right now with trying to figure out Ben Simmons, situation, they're a really good team. And even if he isn't available at the beginning of the season, I think they're going to be one of the best teams in the East, regardless of how that situation is sorted out. Joel Joel Embiid was an MVP candidate last year. They have a bunch of other really good players. So, I mean, are you catching that at a good time? Perhaps because of all the other stuff that's been swirling around them, but I I wouldn't want to, I don't want them as the first opponent of of, on the, the schedule, just because of the fact that they're a really good team. They have one of the best coaches in the league. So I mean, it's, it's a tough way to start the season, I think, regardless. Before I get to Aaron, yeah. I should I should correct myself that there's no Tyrone Maxey on the squad. It's Tyrese Maxey. So if anyone's looking for a Tyrone, there is no <laughs> Tyrone. So I just wanted to clarify that it's Tyrese Maxey, but uh, maybe we, no one ever noticed. I thought maybe they like I thought maybe he had like an identical twin that they signed or something. And I missed that in the scouting report. So nope, definitely yeah. just one maxi on the team. But Aaron, go okay. ahead with your thoughts on the Philadelphia 76ers. Yeah, I mean, we're still getting ready for a regular season exactly. here. We're so preseason uh form here a couple of days away. No, but the the 76 or so Ben Simmons, you know, is back with the team. He's full participant at practice. Doc Rivers says that, you know, he's not in game shape though, that he's not ready to play a game. So I don't, I don't know if he'll go on Wednesday. It doesn't look like he will. Um, but regardless, you can't overlook this team. As you know, Jim mentioned, there's a lot of other very viable players on this squad, and they did really well um, late in the season last year, even as Simmons was kind of checked out maybe um, with the team late in the season. So it's going to be a big game, and you know the Pelicans can't come in you know, kind of thinking that it's going to be easier because of the off season drama heading into this, this season with the 76ers. Um, you know, they did have, they went two and two in the preseason. They did have their last preseason game on for last Friday. So they haven't had as much time off in between as the Pelicans have. I think the Pelicans were a team that ended their preseason games earlier than most teams in the NBA did. So they really had a good amount of time to kind of lock some things in to get healthy. So that's something that, that bodes well for them getting ready for this matchup as well. 
Absolutely. And it should be a fun matchup on Wednesday, but I think you're right. I don't think this team, it, it has that mindset of they're looking ahead or, you know, looking down on the Sixers because you're right. They were number one seed for a reason last year and they still have plenty of talent with Tobias Harris, Joel Embiid, Seth Curry and others. Um, but I think it could be a nice momentum booster as you uh, get on the road right after that for a three game road trip against teams that you saw in the preseason, Chicago, Minnesota, it could be a winnable road trip. But again, I think, not looking ahead will be crucial for this team and see how they adapt without Zion and, uh, and see kind of how they play under Willie Green. I think we all forget that this is going to be Willie Green's first regular season game as a head coach. He's had summer league, which he had some success. He had to, uh, a tough preseason, but dealing without some of the rotation players. So it made it harder for him, I think, to figure out what he really has in his team when they have their full complement of guys. So I think that's another factor that could go in this first couple of weeks is, is you know, Willie Green, uh, I think everyone has – confidence in the world that he'll be able to do fine uh but it's always a different element when you're in your first regular season game as a head coach when those lights go on Wednesday night um I, I think one he's gonna be really excited and I think uh everyone's gonna be excited to see this team tip things off against the 76ers but of course we'll have everything for you leading up to Wednesday's game we'll have another podcast for you on Wednesday guests to be determined and we'll have a full hour of Pre-game show on the Pelicans radio network. We'll have Pelicans weekly at 6, Pelicans warm up at 6.30. More on that on our Wednesday podcast. We'll have Jim back on our post-game show on Wednesday, back on the podcast for good, and Aaron Summers look out for her on the sidelines on Wednesday night, and, of course, on the Pelicans radio network as well. I can't believe we're here. We've been talking about this for a while, two more days, and then we're tipping off. I know you all are excited, and I appreciate both of you coming on today. Thanks. Looking forward to it. Yeah, Daniel, I'm looking forward to it as well. I can't wait for Wednesday and to, to get started. I, I think the first couple of weeks of the season are going to be really interesting. I hope that uh, I know the players often say that they don't pay attention to media reports, and I don't think professional athletes necessarily need that much motivation, but I, I kind of hope that they have listened to some of the stuff and caught some of the skepticism and the, the doubting of what they can do and, and that they're able to take that onto the court starting Wednesday. A little bulletin board material doesn't hurt anyone, so we'll see what they take from that and take it into Wednesday's game against Philadelphia. Again, we'll have another podcast for you on Wednesday. You can find this podcast, pelicans.com, Pelicans mobile app, and download the show on iTunes. And some of our podcasts have ventured their way onto YouTube, so check us out. That means you have to see our faces, so I apologize at least for mine in advance. Um, but check us out on YouTube as well if you miss any of our shows online. For Jim Eikenhofer, Aaron Summers, I'm Daniel Salerson. Thanks for listening to the Pelicans podcast presented by CP.